I remember someone once saying to me, I can resist everything except temptation. They were thinking in terms of the fact that uh, I shouldn't have that second helping of dessert because I've got to think of the calories and it's a special occasion so I'll go back onto my diet tomorrow. When we use the words temptation, we usually use it in the sense of uh, a negativity, it, it, uh, tempting us to do something wrong, uh, seducing us, uh, an enticement to, uh, to break the rules. But this is not the sense in which we, we're going to look at this this morning because really it, the, the word that's used in the scriptures in the context that we're looking at is, is test. It's not so much being tempted. It's not tempting to do wrong because let's face it, God, would te God tempts no one to do wrong. It's rather a testing us to, 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 to keep, on to the, keep on track to do the right thing. There's a verse in, the, in Genesis chapter 22 which, which mentions that Ab God, in the old translations, it says God tempted Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice, but it's really test. When God said to Abraham to take his son up to the mountain to offer him as a sacrifice, the real word there is test. God was testing him to see the extent of his faith and whether he would stand up under pressure. We know that uh, metals have to be decker buses here in, the, in Perth, but when the, before double-deckers are released onto the roads, one of the tests is that the, the upper deck is, is placed with, with weights and the, there's no, nothing at all in the lower deck because it, the test for the bus is that the, the most extreme case would be when all the passengers are sitting on the top deck and there's nobody in the bottom deck testing for equilibrium, testing for balance, testing for the fact that it can meet the, the needs. So testing takes part, takes place in all, in all sorts of lives. There's a verse in, in, what we've, in what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer which is a, a bit of a, a, causes a misunderstanding. Have you ever wondered about that, ver that word, that phrase, lead us not into temptation? It really means do not bring us to the test. It's not, it's not that God would lead us into doing wrong. It's do not bring us to the test beyond what we are able to bear. That's basically what that, that phrase in the Lord's Prayer is saying to us. We read in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you to be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide <coughs> is tempted or tested, but is yet without sin. So there we see that even with the testing, there is a way to handle it. There is a way of escape. And this morning, we're going to just look for a short while at the temptations that Jesus endured, particularly those in the wilderness. We read that after Jesus was baptised, the devil drove him into the wilderness. He was thrust out. We saw last week the high moment when Jesus was baptised by John in the River Jordan and when he came up out of the water there was the dove that descended upon him and the voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. This was a pinnacle, this was a high moment in the life of Jesus but immediately afterwards the very next thing that happens, the, de the, the devil drives him out into the wilderness because he's going to face an extreme test. We know too that Elijah the prophet, when he had that great victory, uh, they had that great victory over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. 450 false prophets were put to death. But immediately after that, when Jezebel, that evil queen, heard that he destroyed these men, 
she, she went after him and he fled into the desert and he was in such a place that he wanted to give up and he, his life. So from that high moment of when he was able in God's, with God's strength to defeat the prophets of Baal, and then, he, then he goes out into the wilderness soon afterwards and he's at a very low point and he's almost ready to give up when God speaks to him and, and picks him up and, and sends him out into ministry again. And that tells me that from the experience of Jesus and from these old patriarchs that we face similar situations. We find high, there were high points in our lives. There, there were moments of elation, moment, moments of extreme inspiration. And then there were the times in our lives when we have a downer. And sometimes it's immediately after we've had a, a, a mountaintop experience that we find that we are faced with a real test. We are faced with a real test. I know there are some people, I know there are some of you here in the congregation who are soccer fanatics like I am. <laughs> and they say that after a team, when the team scores a goal, you know there's a wonderful, you know, they're all over one another and they're celebrating. The, the, the team is at the most vulnerable immediately after that goal is scored. And how often, if they let their guard drop a little bit and the other team can fight back and score a goal. So, in other words, it happens in life. Immediately after a high point, we suddenly find that things collapse around us and we are facing, we are facing a, a moment when we're in the valley. So Jesus faced that. From the high point of his baptism, he goes up into the wilderness, thrust into the wilderness is the word which Mark used. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness, there to be tested of the devil. So there we are. What an, what an experience. And the wilderness, you know, is, is, a, is a common theme throughout the scriptures. And part of our lessons during this series are to connect the Old Testament ideas that, that, that are there to, to, to bring them up to date and see that how they relate to things that happened in the life of Jesus. And it's interesting that Jesus was in the wilderness tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights. The number 40 is a very significant number. In fact, in our Tuesday morning Bible study group not long ago, we looked at significant numbers. We looked at a little bit of numerology. Uh, we looked at the number 3, we looked at the number 7, we looked at the number 12, and we looked at the number 40. 40 days and 40 nights Jesus was fasting in the wild. And we also then saw that the number 40 in the Old Testament is that is 40 years the children of Israel wandered in the desert, do you remember? Because they refused to enter into the promised land. They refused to enter into the promised land and God punished them and they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until, until that time was over and they had another opportunity. 40 years they were fasting. And if we look at Psalm 95, there are some verses there from verses 8 through to 11 which I hope will come up on the screen. Have we got Psalm 95, have we? <clears throat> if not, I'll have to open my scripture. Here we are. We'll have to look at... Oh, here we are, we are. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa, in the wilderness, when you, your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. And another translation says, and they will never enter into my rest. So you see the number 40? Jesus is 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness. The children of Israel were 40 days in the wilderness wanderings where they were tested. What we also notice from the scripture this morning in Matthew chapter 4, which was, which was read to us, is that Jesus faced the wilderness experience alone. Jesus went out into the wilderness alone. There are some things in life we have to face alone. Alone from the point of view of human, of being hum with human, other humans. Some of us may, may all... We sometimes like to be, have people around us, don't we? A lot of people don't like being alone. 
They always want to have company. They always have people around them. But some things in life, some situations in life require us to be alone, humanly speaking, but alone with God, alone with God. And that's what happened in this case with Jesus. He was, he was thrust into the wilderness alone to there struggle, to there be tempted, to there be tested. And sometimes we have to face that same situation. We have to face the wilderness. We have to face air wilderness alone. We have to spend time away from other humans to be in, in, a, in a situation where we can be in relationship with God in a very intimate way. We often ask the question, how did Matthew know about what happened? that Jesus went into the wilderness and, and what happened when he was there being tempted. The only way that Matthew could have known was that Jesus would have told him. Jesus must have, must have shared with Matthew and, and maybe all the other disciples what had happened when he went into the wilderness. Jesus would have opened his heart, would, would have shared these intimate moments with Matthew so that he could be able to pen them for us to be able for us to be able to uh, know about what happened when Jesus went into the wilderness. We sometimes try to keep things to ourselves. We, we, we do need those people in our lives with whom we can share the struggles that we face. This was, Jesus was bearing himself before Matthew when he told him about this incident. We do need close Christian friends, those that we trust, that we can share when we're struggling in life, that we can open up our hearts, that we can find blessing by letting another share in the issues that are challenges, challenging us in our daily lives. Yes, we need those trusted friends. And so we approach this passage in reverence. We almost approach it on our knees when we, when we see how Jesus was vulnerable, making himself vulnerable as he went up into the as he went up into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, one thing we notice about these specific temptations was that they are only relevant to someone who had the special powers. The temptations that Jesus suffered were probably not the ones that we may face today. The first temptation. Turn these little pieces of limestone rock into bread. He'd been, he'd been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Turn these stones into bread. Meet your own needs. But Jesus never acted selfishly, but always to, and only to bless others. The day after the, the feeding of the 5,000, which is going to be another topic down the track, uh, the people caught up with Jesus the next day. He'd moved to the other side of the lake. But they, they, they went around the side and they caught up with him the next day. And uh, Jesus said to them, uh, you're not really coming to see me because of the things that I'm teaching, but you've only come because you want a free meal. So their, 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 motive, their motive was not, uh, not a spiritual one. Uh, they were unaware that they had a deeper need. And the, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8 and verse 3, uh, and he humbled you, this is what God did to the people of Israel, and humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So those that were, that were crying for, for physical bread, they perhaps had a, had, didn't have a realisation of the, of the deeper need. So Jesus quotes to them that passage, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Jesus didn't, wasn't tempted or tested to turn these stones into bread to, fe to feed himself. He only ever used that power for the blessing of others. Second, and then, he, then he, the second temptation, having held at bay the uh, evil one with a quote from scripture, he, the devil takes him up to a pinnacle of the temple and says, you know, cast yourself down. 
throw yourself up oh, down from the temple and this this will people will t- take notice of you this this act uh, angels will bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone now many false prophets in the past had tried sort of feats like this to try and attract attention and to get a following but Jesus once again this test is again to fail this test is to fail because Jesus is not going to be the man who performs stunts. Uh, each, because you, the, the, every time you, you perform a stunt, uh, the next time you've got to do something a little bit more amazing, a little, otherwise people get used to the, the stunt you've just performed. What a tragedy it was to see that news, I think it's in the last couple of weeks, that a stunt man is in a coma because a stunt went drastically wrong. And, he's, and he's, he's injured his body quite seriously. So uh, the sensationalism, sensationalism is doomed to fail. And so many of our, our reality shows, it's sort of on people doing these sort of sensational things. Sensationalism is doomed to fail. And Jesus was not to be test, tempted. He was, not to, he was not to fail in this test. And so he, he would have been, a, good, he would have been a, a, a reminder to the Jews had he jumped from the temple in Malachi 3, 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before you, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. In other words, jump from this pinnacle, the Lord will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. But Jesus was not to be tempted. Jesus was not to fall for that test. And so he once again uh, holds back the temptation by again quoting from Scripture, in Deuteronomy 6 and the 16th verse, you shall not put your Lord, the Lord your God, to the test as you did at Massa. You shall not put me to the test. So once again, he's able to hold at bay that test that was thrust at him that day. And then, having failed on two occasions, the devil takes him to a pinnacle of the temple and he says, fall down and worship me. I'll give you everything. He tries to make Jesus compromise. Don't set the bar too high. You know, we can never change the world by becoming like the world. Jesus was not to be deviating from his his purpose. I'm told that it was Martin Luther who who saw... uh, He thought he had a vision perhaps of a devil while, while he was struggling with testing... And uh, he threw an ink pot. He was, in a, he was in a castle in Europe. He threw an ink pot at the wall of the castle and that ink stain is there to this day, we're told, because the devil was tempting him, testing him, and he resisted it. Sometimes we, we, we poke fun at the devil, we, we caricature him like a you know, pitchfork and horns and all that sort of thing. The devil's not like that. He's an angel of light. He's an attractive being and that's why we fall for his testings. That's why we fall for his temptations because we don't take him seriously. We let down our guard. We let down our guard and we can fail. But Jesus Jesus was not to be tested beyond what he could hold back. And we read in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 13, The Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. He was not going to compromise. He was not going to fall for the devil's trickery. He was going to remain true to his purpose. Now, those were the three initial temptations that Jesus faced. But we have to remember that uh, this wasn't the end of the temptations that he faced during his life. Because the Bible tells us that the devil left him for a season or left him till a more opportune occasion. So the devil was going to come back from time to time and, te- and test, him. He test him. He tested him at the, uh, great, at the good confession when, when Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And they said, some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets or John the Baptist come back from the dead, all these sorts of things. But Jesus said, whom do you say? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then he went 
having blessed Peter for that statement, Jesus went on to say, but the Son of Man is going to be taken by men's hands and nailed to that cross. He's going to die he's going to, and he's going to rise again from the dead. All these things are going to happen to him. And Peter said to him, no, Lord, these things won't be. Here's the devil working through Peter to try and say to Jesus, no, you don't have to go to the cross. And Jesus has to resist that temptation by saying, get thee hence, Satan, be gone. Because Peter was the vehicle through whom the testing and the temptation was coming. In John chapter 12, verse 20 to 24, we read of some Greeks coming to see Jesus. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was at Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone but it dies. What's, how is this a temptation? We know from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the Jews seek after a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. And with, the, with Jesus as the sublimest teacher that the world has ever known, they were, these Greeks were coming to Jesus. We would see Jesus as if to say, Jesus, come away with us. Be our man. Share with us the wisdom. Come the way we want you to go. You see, this again is the temptation of the devil to deviate him from that pathway that he knows he has to follow to the cross. And Jesus then, by the words he uses in the immediate, the immediate, the immediate context of having been asked to go away with these, with these Greeks, Jesus says this, the hour has come and the, so the Son of Man is to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, and so on. In other words, he's saying, I've got to go to the cross. I've got to die. My life has got to be taken from me. I cannot, I am not going to be deviated from the purpose that I have. And so he rejects their invitation to go away with them. And then we come to a, a passage in the, in Luke chapter 22, where Jesus is uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane and he acknowledges, he says to his disciples, you are those who stayed with me in my trials. And then we go down to verses 42 to 44. He, Jesus then goes away and prays on his own, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Don't you feel that in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's, there's that inner struggle, the devil is tempting him, and he's, so that he asks the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The devil does not... Turn him away from the pathway that he knows he must follow. And then the final, the final temptation that I want to look at this morning is when Jesus is hanging on the cross and, the, and they, the crowd, they cry out to him, come down from the cross. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross and we will believe you. What a hollow claim that was. What a hollow... It was, it was the devil using them because they, they said, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross and we will believe you. I want to suggest to you this morning, it's because he is the son of God that he did not come down from the cross. Amen. He came to that place to give his life and he would not come down from the cross. We sometimes sing that song. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. That's the saviour. That's the saviour that we worship. Our temptations in life will never go away. As Christians of many years standing, 
we might think we're, we're pretty tough now. We're, we're... Always be on your guard. Always be on your guard because temptation, the devil is, I think it's the, the idea of the, it's, it, it, the temptation is crouching at the door. It's crouching at the door. Temptations never go away. But praise God, Jesus overcame them all. He overcame, overcame the testings and he died on Calvary's cross for you and me. And if there's anyone here this morning who's not a Christian, he's the saviour we present to you this morning. The one who died for our sins. There's a hymn which says, Jesus died for all mankind and Jesus died for me. He died for each one of us. I would urge you to consider seriously the claims of the Lord Jesus and accept him as saviour and lord of your lives. But for those of us that have been Christians for many years, don't let your guard down. Don't let your guard down. The battle rages. We know the wiles of the devil and we need to remain strong. Stay strong in the word of God. Stay, stay strong in your quiet times in prayer. Stay strong by being with other Christians, by sharing your lives with each other so that we build each other up and comfort one another and encourage one another. The battle never goes away. But trusting in the Saviour, we have that glorious hope that we shall be victorious. May it be so for his name's sake. I'm going to pray a special prayer that was written many years ago. It's a set prayer, but I've owned it as one that I use. And after that, we're going to sing a song and then our meeting will be over. So let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that we may be ready to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.